Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome today. Uh, my name is Stacy Mitchell. I'm the co-executive director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and I'm super excited about today's event. Um, and I'm excited to welcome all of you. We had over 700 people register for this event, which is just incredible. Um, we are making a recording today, so there will be video of this event that we'll post on our website and our YouTube page, um, and we will email it out to everyone who registered. Um, so we encourage you to share it with your networks and with people who weren't able to attend today. Um, ILSR's mission is uh, to challenge concentrated corporate power and to build thriving local uh, equitable communities. Um, we've been engaged in energy policy work since our founding in 1974. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that work, it's really an, just an incredibly exciting time in the energy sector, a lot of important change going on and a lot of important opportunities. Um, I invite you to check out our Energy Democracy Initiative, which you can find on our website. We publish reports, we produce a weekly podcast and newsletter, and we're very active working alongside grassroots organizations across the country, building coalitions um, and working to build a equitable, uh, decentralized, democratic uh, energy future. So the reason we wanted to host this event today, um, because as I said, it's a, just a, a really incredible, important moment in the shape of the electricity sector. I and mean, we wanted to have a conversation about how our electricity system is structured and you know, how the structure that we have now, the structure of investor owned monopoly electric utilities, you know, which may have made sense a hundred years ago, today is really at odds with the public interest, is really working at cross purposes with building a carbon-free future, with rectifying racial inequality, and with building um, strong local communities and a vibrant democracy. The good news is that there are some just really incredible grassroots initiatives going on across the country in which people are coming up with innovative ways to challenge control by monopoly utilities, um, and moving towards implementing new policies and, that would completely restructure the electricity system and really change um, the structure of ownership of scale and decision making within the electric uh, within the electricity system, and do so in ways that would very much um, align um, our electricity sector with the public interest. Today's event is a chance to meet some of the cutting edge leaders um, and to hear about what they're doing in a number of different uh, places across the country. If you're coming to this conversation because you mainly focus on energy uh, issues or climate issues in your work, I think today's event's gonna offer a chance to hear and explore how some of the frameworks and the thinking around anti-monopoly uh, and anti-monopoly policy tools may be useful in what you're doing. And if you're coming to this from uh, doing work on antitrust and anti-monopoly, I think the energy sector is a really intriguing case study particularly in helping us think about how to govern a network industries, how to govern infrastructure. Um, I think there's some really important insights we can glean here as we think about what are the public policies we need to govern new forms of in infrastructure, including in particular the tech platforms, Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and so on. So the run of show today, you know, uh, just to give you a quick overview of how today is going to work, we've got two really terrific panels. Um, each is going to be about 25 minutes. In the first, we're going to hear two uh, hear from two lawmakers, uh, state lawmakers from my home state of Maine, who led a successful effort in the legislature to pass a law that would um, allow uh, our dominant uh, uh, investor-owned electric utility to become a consumer-owned electric utility. Uh, that law was vetoed by our governor. Um, so uh, the lawmakers we have to, here today have joined with a set of citizen leaders and are working to put that on the ballot in 2023. It's really an incredible campaign called Our Power. So that'll be the first panel. And then for the second panel, we're gonna broaden out um, and talk to some cutting edge thinkers and advocates who are working to address utility power in other parts of the country, um, including challenging utility mergers, um, and using antitrust law uh, to go after uh, some of the uh, predatory things that monopoly utilities are doing. The event ends at 2.15 today, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll bring everybody together for, for a sort of final uh, short roundup uh, and questions. And throughout today, we are gonna be trying to take questions from the audience. And if you've got a question, Instead of putting it in the chat, please put it in the Q&A and we will keep an eye on those and work those into the conversation. 
So today's event ends at 2.15, but there will be um, an after party. So we encourage you to stick around afterwards if you like. That after party is gonna be a chance to talk to the two leaders from Our Power from the Maine Initiative Campaign. Um, if you wanna go uh, more in depth on what they're doing, it's a really interesting campaign. There are lots of opportunities to get involved. And if you wanna just learn more about that, just hang on uh, after the event ends officially at 2.15 and we'll transition to having a more uh, intermittent conversation with, uh, with leaders of that. Uh, finally, um, uh, I wanna thank uh, Jess Del Fiaco, ILSR's communication manager, uh, who's been uh, instrumental in pulling together this event. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce ILSR's other co-director, John Farrell, who is gonna moderate the first panel. Uh, John is the director of our Energy Democracy Initiative. Welcome, John. Well, I'm so glad to be with, here with you, Stacy. And uh, I'm here from my basement office, my COVID retreat. If I'm shivering on screen, it's because it's cold here in Minnesota, minus 10, but I'm also shivering in anticipation of this conversation. Uh, which I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, what's going on with our power and, and with the other panels that we'll be talking to is really a transformational conversation that's happening in the electricity sector that is tying into this broader conversation about corporate power. Um, in the electricity sector, and specifically, it's the culmination of almost a decade of exploration by cities, by communities, by states on this idea of who owns the energy system and how can communities have more choice. Um, we've been tracking at ILSR lots of uh, places that have uh, done municipalization campaigns, public power takeovers that have looked at ways that um, in, in California and Illinois and other states where cities can take control of energy purchasing. But without getting too much into the weeds, I just have to say that this really what what has been discussed in Maine with with our power really is transformational in terms of talking about the platform of the utility system as a platform, as this idea, as a place where people might be able to transact to innovate entrepreneurs and businesses could really help us solve the knotty and thorny clean energy and, and energy reliability and affordability questions of the 21st century. And they're doing that in a really novel and exciting way uh, that I think is the evolution of a lot of these other efforts that have been building up. So I am very pleased to welcome uh, Senator Rick Bennett and Representative Seth Berry uh, to join me for a conversation about our power uh, Seth and Rick, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. Thanks for having us. Wonderful to be with you. Um, I just want to start off by asking a question, sort of the generic question for people who might not be as familiar as, as I have been in following the Our Power effort, but you know, what is this really about? Why did the, you know, this, this um, idea of a consumer-owned utility that would kind of open access to the grid system, why did the legislature feel compelled to step in and to restructure the state's electricity market in Maine. Um, and, and Rick, I was hoping to start with you. Sure. Um, well, and, and I hope you go over to Seth because Seth really has been the, uh, the, the, the leading light in this, um, in this amazing uh, battle um, that has turned into quite, a, quite a, an amazing movement in Maine. Um, but, but I think there, the, the reality is that um, we're, we're undergoing so much change in the world today, right? I mean, people um, are, feel lost in the traditional institutions that we've relied on to govern our activities, uh, whether that's in the banking section, the sector, the power sector, the university sector, the media. Uh, and, and at the same time, we have a, an immense opportunity to democratize our decision-making. Uh, and so it, it's interesting that in this, area of power where we need to have a grid which is more responsive and more elastic and more flexible where electrons are moving in all directions, not just from one big power source out, but from many, many thousands of power sources around and, and then feeding into the grid. Um, we still have this antiquated system of governing our actual grids and we rely on these investor owned utilities in Maine for most, but not all, of, of the grid management in Maine. And these investor-owned utilities um, have proven unworthy of the, the job. And, and I also have to say, somehow along the line, the Maine owners and managers of Central Maine Power Company and the old Bangor Hydro, which is now Versant, suddenly uh, we wake up one day and Central Maine Power Company is owned by a Spanish conglomerate named Ibadrola, 
which in turn is owned uh, the largest owners of the, the Norway Oil Fund and the government of Qatar. And, um, and the other, uh, the old Bangor Hydro isn't owned in Bangor, Maine anymore. It's owned by the city of Calgary, Canada, 100%. So we have this distant ownership. We have an unresponsive uh, failing um, uh, on every scale. In fact, the lowest rated uh, power companies in the country uh, because of reliability problems, cost problems. Um, and so we, we come to this point where this isn't just about electric power, it's about power of people for self-determination to control the grid themselves and make it a grid for the future. So that's where, really where, what this, this movement has become, more than just about power, electrical power, but really about political power. Seth, I'd love I, if you have more to add to that, but also could you talk a little bit about why there's this specific focus on like ownership and control of the grid platform? You know, Rick kind of already alluded to this, that we're talking about sort of absentee ownership in a way, right? You have these utilities, these private companies, they're not even owned by entities that are within the state of Maine, within the United States. Um, in the proposal for uh, uh, that our power put forward in the legislation and the, in the ballot initiative question, it really focuses on this idea of a uh, consumer owned utility, but that, with, that will have open access. Can you talk about how that addresses this issue of power and why that's such an important piece? Sure. You know, it, it, first of all, it's just so great to be here with you, all of you. And I'm, I'm uh, honored and proud every time that, that uh, Senator Bennett and I get to work on this together. Um, I think it, it's important to note uh, for folks that aren't familiar, um, Senator Bennett was the president of the Maine Senate in a previous lifetime. Um, he's now the, the, the lead on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. He's also on the board of an, an information uh, internet services provider, a fantastic scrappy uh, business here in Maine, um, among his many other um, uh, impressive uh, credentials. I come at it from the other side of the aisle. I am a former Democratic uh, legislative leader. So we have a, a you, in front of you, you have a Republican former state Senate president and a Democratic former uh, House majority leader. Um, we have joined in this effort because so much is at stake. And I think, John, your question is, it goes right to the heart of it. Um, this idea of a, of a non-discriminatory uh, platform provider and, and, a, and, and this concern about monopoly is pretty hot right now in the information space, right? People kind of get that. They're like, you know, Facebook is taking over. This is a problem. Um, you know, there, there are two major cable companies and, and, and they have a stranglehold. They don't, they've agreed not to compete with each other. They have a monopoly in their areas. Um, you know, cell phone services aren't much better. So, so as we've seen information, the information highway uh, be purchased and increasing, you know, toll plazas put up on it, um, and, and, and really a, a, a huge negative impact on our, on our very democracy, right, which depends on good information. Um, we're kind of familiar with that, right? That's more in the public eye. But there's this other thing happening, which also has to do with poles and wires, and it is electricity. And I would argue that every bit as much is at stake, because if you think about it, how do we decarbonize, right? How do we save the planet? We all know that the planet is, uh, it, you know, ha has has very very few um, uh, geological, uh, you know, seconds on the clock left. Uh, if if we don't do something drastic, and that involves electricity, we need to shift to electric vehicles. We need to shift to uh, heat pumps to heat and cool our home. Um, clean electricity is how we get out of the climate emergency, and all of that needs to flow over the poles and wires. Those poles and wires are a monopoly. And because of the last 150 years or so of, of the evolution of that industry, we have allowed it without really thinking about it, without really noticing, we've allowed it to globalize. We've allowed it to conglomerate. We've allowed it to, um, to become uh, uh, the, 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 the province of the few in order to extract value from the many. And, uh, and, and so this is about power. It is about money. It's also very much about climate. Um, if we're going to decarbonize, we know that we need to shift to consumer ownership because it works. Because if you look at the first six communities in the US, the only six that I know of that have actually fully decarbonized, all six of them were served by consumer-owned utilities. 
and I can I can you know rattle off the names if you like, but four of them are in just happen to be in conservative parts of the country. Consumer-run utilities, by the way, are not a new thing. They serve 28% of America right now. Um, some are co-ops, which serve the, the the rural areas. They were the kind of the last to get service because the the big boys didn't want to cover them. wasn't profitable enough. Um, so thank you, FDR. Um, and munis have been around uh, for a, a, even longer. They, they've been around since the very dawn of the electrical era. So between the munis and the co-ops, 28%, it, those are the places that, that are that where they have turned to it that have decarbonized fully, successfully, uh, gotten to 100% renewable electricity. Um, in the large utility space, uh, I think of SMUD, I think of uh, LA, they're the leaders in getting to 100% renewables as well and they just happen to be consumer owned. Um, it's not an accident and it's, uh, it, it is very analogous to the information space. If you want a utility that isn't intent on pre preserving and protecting its stranglehold on that, that highway of electricity, just like the information highway, then you, you need to have the right motives, uh, the right incentives and not perverse incentives. Right now, all the incentives are about protecting what they have maintaining the status quo, making sure that that transition is frankly as expensive as possible. And that's not gonna help us if we're trying to get there. So um, I'll stop there, but I have a lot more to say, John. Um, I'd love to actually get into this a little bit more. One of the things that you've already highlighted in terms of the benefits of this approach is that we can meet some of the climate and clean energy goals <clears throat> that we hold collectively easier. That it's, uh, we have, you know, whether it's in transportation, whether it's in building, heating and cooling, there are all of these different facets of our economy that can run on electricity and electricity is something that we know how to clean up and make renewable and, and make low carbon and make low pollution. Um, you kind of reference this in this in, in terms of the way that these businesses operate, right? They're, they're for-profit businesses, they're operating in an environment that encourages them to do certain things and make money in certain ways. Can you tell me about how that how the flip side of that, how going to consumer ownership uh, brings benefits in terms of trying to get to those broader goals. What are some of the other benefits that you're going to see, whether it's in terms of costs or, or workers or labor uh, uh, in, in using this approach to um, uh, structuring the, uti uh, the utility of the electricity market? Sure. Do you want to start off, Rick, or should I? Sure, I'll, I'll just jump in with a couple of thoughts, and that is, and this shouldn't be difficult for Maine people to understand, because as Seth said, there are 2,900 municipal cooperative uh, COU kind of structures serving electricity customers today in the country. Well, in Maine, there are nine consumer-owned utilities actually serving some of the most rural parts of Maine, Washington and Hancock counties, for example, far down east. Those 97 towns, in fact, are served by consumer-owned utilities, and they have experienced um, the much better um, rates on their electricity, 53% less. They've got a much more reliable uh, service, uh, isn't disrupted as much by storms. The, so I think the, the proof is already there about the savings that can be achieved and the responsiveness that you can get when you have owners who are the customers and they are going to insist that the companies run for their benefit, not for the inv investors in far off lands. So, and um, as Seth was also saying, I mean, part of these savings and just because people are nicer because they live closer to the, to the utility or the grid, it's, it's because of the way that the finance works. Most utilities, um, because they're, they've got captive customers, the natural monopolies, they're, people love to um, give them a very uh, low risk uh, uh, bonding. And so revenue bond, um, revenue bonds can, can fund much of the capitalization necessary for modernizing the grid with consumer owned utilities. And, and those revenue bonds are currently selling at two or 3%. Um, the investor-owned utilities, however, because of Supreme Court decisions from nearly a century ago, starting nearly a century ago, have baked in returns for capital investments, returns in equity of 8 to 12% with some variations. So because of that differential between the 2 and 3% and the 8 and 12%, there is an opportunity to capture, um, recapture money that ratepayers are now paying in and have savings in the monthly bill, but also to capture some of that money to update and modernize the grid. 
So I, I think um, that that's already been shown. And I, if people are interested in the impact on Maine, particularly, there ha there's a lot of research available at our website, ourpowermaine.org in that way. That's right. And I'll just chime in that uh, we um, initially began this journey in, in 2019 with a bill that uh, went before the legislature. That bill turned into a feasibility study and the Public Utilities Commission contracted with London Economics. Um, our PUC, by the way, is, you know, they're, they're, they're friendly with the utilities. That's who they see on a day in and day out basis. So we didn't have super high hopes, but, um, and, and by the way, London Economics, uh, uh, most of their work is for investor and utilities. So for that reason too, we weren't uh, super optimistic, but they came back with a clean bill of health. They said, this is number one, this is constitutional. Um, yes, you can uh, require that the utility sell uh, to a new consumer and utility. And number two, um, it will save you money. The ch chances are their, their reference case, their, their um, sort of middle of the road assumption was you might see a little bit of an uptick in rates in the first few years, five to seven years, and then increasing savings, lower rates from there on out and, and continuing, continuing, continuing to get lower. Um, that analysis was then reviewed by a main based energy economist by the name of Dr. Richard Silkman. Um, he took it a step further and said, wait a minute, you know, you, you didn't, you forgot to mention uh, there's about $4 billion sitting on the books uh, in a reserve account in your, in your own economic model. So you got you to gotta count that. That belongs to ratepayers and some other uh, adjustments as well. He said, no, you're, you're going to save $9 billion over the first 30 years alone, which in, a Maine, in Maine is a lot. It might not be as much in California, but you know, um, we're a small state. $9 billion. And uh, that's in savings, net savings, right? Even after you pay down the acqu acquisition. Um, and you will see ratepayer savings from year one. So you can reduce rates. You can invest some of that uh, money, some of that savings in building out the grid and modernizing the grid. And it's a win-win all around. Um, we also, in our proposal, allocate some of that to better pay and conditions for workers. We make sure that the utility is required to use union labor to uh, invest in local businesses and uh, provide some protections for workers. They keep their jobs, their benefits. Um, they're two collective bargaining units, so they go to the higher one. So we, it's a, it is a win-win all around. Uh, and really, you, you do, as Rick said, you, you, you simply do this by displacing a, a very high cost business model, which has worked okay, I guess, in the 20th century, but is fundamentally broken for the 21st and for the challenges that we face in the future. Here's one of the things I've been sort of skimming the Q&A and just want to remind folks that if you have questions, uh, we probably won't get to all of them like every webinar, but uh, we are skimming through them to try to see what we can uh, bubble up. I'm seeing a few folks mentioning this idea of like, uh, well, two kind of two threads here. One is, why is public ownership necessarily better? So you mentioned that Seth already a couple of places that are doing good. There's also plenty of examples of you know publicly owned utilities that aren't necessarily doing great on the measures that we care about, especially around like clean energy. Um, you know, so what's how are you thinking about that? And I get, the other one I thought was really interesting was why do you want to buy the grid assets when they may not end up being very useful? Uh, and I think that I think those are both good questions, and I'm guessing that you've thought of answers to both of those as part of this. Yeah, those are those are great. Do you want do you want me to take that, Rick, or do you want to jump in? Um, well, let me just say uh, there's. I know there are parts of this which you're able able to answer uh, better, but I, I would say um, that um, accountability is key here. Okay, and um, you know nobody can guarantee performance, but you can certainly guarantee who's accountable for that performance. And right now, as as mentioned, um, we have a broken model. Uh, the it's built to serve people in distant places, not the rate pairs. And uh, the, the fundamental thing that we've got um, with this model, it's not a government ownership model. It is a consumer ownership model. Uh, the, the, the board uh, would shift from a lot of foreign um, business people to an ownership model where the, the board of, of directors for the nonprofit would be elected, seven of them would be elected by the people of Maine, and then six would be elected by those seven 
So you'd have a full board of 13 members and the six that would be elected by the seven would be people to infill skills gaps. And, uh, and so we've got this model which doesn't have government ownership. It has no reliability and no, no reliance, I should say, on, on the uh, taxpayer. On, uh, it doesn't have any appointments by the governor or appointments by the legislature. This is an independent, not-for-profit corporation that will then hire a C-suite who uh, a C-suite of executives will run the company. And so you have the, that level of accountability where the management is hired to do a job by a board that's elected by the people. And, and, and so the, it's a completely different, uh, completely different um, uh, structure for, for following power and accountability in the structure itself. And I think it's better suited to actually serving the end user client and customer. That's a great answer. And I'll just chime in, um, you know, Senator Bennett really helped us to give a lot of uh, careful consideration and, and imp improvement uh, to the board structure. Uh, that is something you absolutely want to pay attention to. You know, it is possible to create a consumer and utility that is not, that is not well designed, right? And it doesn't have good, good governance standards. Um, so we included things like, you know, freedom of access, you know, it, it has to be transparent. Um, conflict of interest provisions, uh, you know, all of that. The elected appointed hybrid, I think, is a very um, useful addition as well. But just stepping back a bit, you know, taking it to kind of the, the highest level, um, yes, there are these nonprofit consumer owned utilities and these for profit investor owned utilities. And it is true that there are better investor owned utilities and 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 worse consumer owned utilities you know within within those two families right they're not all created equal um in a way i think a business model is like a tool right it's it's a it's potentially a very powerful tool um and the the part of the purpose of the investor owned tool is to make money for shareholders in fact it's it's their number one fiduciary responsibility right they they would be doing a bad job on the board if that was not their top priority that is removed from the consumer-owned model. They don't have to worry about profit. Their focus is on people. And perhaps if you make it so, it's about planet, right? The, the, the people part matters. Their, their number one focus is people. If, if I'm a consumer-owned utility in rural Nebraska, I might not be asked by my constituents to, to care about climate. But you know what? If my constituents do ask me to care about climate, I can put my full attention on that. I don't need to think about how I'm going to maximize the future profit of, of this enterprise. I can go full on to the to, to decarbonization, to a just transition, what I like to call a full, fast, fair, and friendly transition, uh, which is which is in fact what we have to do. Um, it is absolutely critical that we do this, and you know the proof's in the pudding. You know I mentioned the communities that have done it so far. I think that's a good indicator that the business model is the right tool for the challenges that we face today. And do we need to pay attention? You know, once can we create it and then walk away? Uh, you know, of course not, we, we need to pay attention. Democracy is, not a is, is, is a participatory sport, not a spectator sport. And a democratic institution like a consumer and utility uh, needs tending. So um, the, the other question was uh, about why you know, why, why the grid, you know, is the grid kind of, go I, I, I almost took the question to be, is the grid going away in the future? And I don't think it can. I think there are too many um, lower income, vulnerable communities uh, that, that can't simply, you know, put a solar panel on the roof and, and walk away. I think we also have to be cognizant that we use a lot of electricity, a, a lot of energy right now, um, not just in electricity, but to displace petroleum to displace natural gas, to displace number two oil, to displace coal, we're going to have to create a whole heck of a lot of, of grid um, to interconnect, to avoid situations where an isolated part of the grid goes down like it did in Texas. I mean, you, you, need, a, you need a robust grid, you need transmission. Um, it's not all local microgrids and distribution, but, but that is a big piece of it. Um, and, and by the way, we can do more with decentralized solutions uh, if we do have a consumer-owned model. 
simply because you don't have that built-in uh, incentive to build out more transmission and get that high rate of return that Senator Bennett mentioned. So um, I wanna make sure that we uh, check in with you to describe where this campaign is at right now in terms of the referendum. Uh, I just wanted to add one little piece too, I think that's important for folks to understand about the proposal, which is that the Pine Tree Power Company, this consumer owned utility, would also have more open access, that it's not the monopoly in the traditional sense of other consumer owned utilities where mm -hmm. it's the only player that can offer services. I think that open access model really changes the nature of it because the accountability isn't just through your board, it's through the other players. It's through the other folks that are participating that can bring energy services to the system. So with that in mind, uh, tell us a little bit about how this campaign is going. Uh, you, you mentioned that there was work at the legislature. How is that transformed to go to the ballot? And what does that look like? How, what's that environment like? What's the, what's the struggle here? And, and how, uh, what is your hope for it? Before we do that, uh, John, I just wanted to mention one other thing, which uh, in Maine, as in some, a lot of other places, there is a separation between this transmission and distribution side of utility and the generation side of utility. We already have separated that years ago in Maine. And so the, what we're talking about here is the control of the grid itself, which is a natural monopoly, which is the, the, the poles and the wires and the transformers and all of those things. And so um, it, it's, it's different in, in other communities where the generation is also part of the mix. Um, so I'll let uh, Seth though um, talk about where the, uh, where the campaign is at right now. That's a, that's a great um, note, Rick, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up just to, to keep people clear. Um, we are looking at generation as well. Um, there's a wonderful book that I'll recommend to people that maps out how generation can be a part of this as well, and even can be consumer owned. Um, but where are we? So I mentioned that in 2019, there was a bill that led to a feasibility study in the following legislature in 2021, uh, with the lead co-sponsor being Senator Rick Bennett and a, a wonderful bipartisan uh, a team, including actually a independent tribal member as well, the legislature, we put forward a bill. We, um, a, a, there was a groundswell of support from across the state. Uh, people are excited about this and overwhelming testimony and support. We then had uh, a, a vote of the House and a vote of the Senate that in each case was bipartisan and was successful, was, was more than half getting it to the governor's desk. The governor did then veto it, although she said some nice things about the concept and does clearly have some real concerns about having the worst performing utility in the country bar none uh, by every standard, Con customer satisfaction, uh, high rates, worst reliability in the nation. So she gets that. Um, she just expressed some concerns about implementation. So although we disagreed, um, we said, okay, governor, we're going to take it to the people directly. We're going to go out and get the signatures. And, and that's what we've done. Um, the, the, the Our Power Coalition, and you can learn lots more at ourpowermaine.org, um, has gone directly to the people exercising uh, Maine's constitutional right to the, the ballot question, the citizen initiative. Um, we have already, just in the last 11 weeks, collected 73% of the signatures needed. Uh, so that's a, a high 40,000, 46, 47,000 signatures. And that was during the very peak of the pandemic here. Hospitalizations were twice as high as they had been. Um, we uh, had volunteers out in the cold because you couldn't do the signature collection indoors for the most part. No corporate money, um, a lot of small dollar donations, but it's, it's really been a, an astonishing, uh, impressive, unprecedented effort. We're very proud of what we've done so far. We are aiming for the 2023 ballot. So it won't be on the ballot this year. It will be on the ballot next year, 2023. And um, that gives us a lot of time to educate voters, to uh, finish up with the signature collection. And we hope to network with other like-minded individuals around the country, because uh, I know there are many uh, folks out there working on similar things, including on this call today. Um, I just wanna again, uh, thank Representative Barry, Senator Bennett for joining us for this conversation about the efforts in Maine. Uh, remind people that there's an after party uh, for folks who wanna learn more about the campaign after this webinar ends in a little over half an hour. Uh, thank you again. And I just wanna invite my 
co-executive director Stacy Mitchell back uh, so we can get ourselves set for our second panel. Thanks again, Seth and Rick. Thank you, an honor to be with you. Our pleasure. Hope folks stay on for the after party. That was terrific. So interesting. I'm uh, I'm really struck, John, about, you know, I, I think Representative Barry's statement of any sort of talking about the importance of you know, figuring out structures that are really aligned, ownership structures that are really aligned with the outcomes that we want to see, but that doesn't obviate the need for nurturing those structures and having democratic oversight and um, a really useful, I think, way of framing and thinking about, you know, not only stuff in the electricity sector, but really across the economy and how we think about policymaking. Excellent. Um, and with that, I am going to um, introduce uh, our next panel, and I, I'm going to moderate this panel. And, and John is going to get to join as a uh, as a speaker on this side. And um, let me introduce our our two other panelists. Uh, really terrific. Uh, Marielle Nanasi is the executive director of the of New Energy Economy, based in New Mexico, which works to transform the energy system and foster a just transition to a renewable future. And Jean Su is the Energy Justice Director and Senior Attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity, based, I believe, in Washington, DC. Excellent. Welcome, both of you. I'm so glad you could join. Um, and just a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, we'll uh, have the second part of the discussion for about 25 minutes, and then all of our panelists are going to come together for, for a wrap up. Um, and so I want to turn first, I think, to you, John. Um, you know, I, I was hoping that you could just zoom out a little bit and talk about how it is that po policymakers structured the electric utility sector a century ago. You know, that structure may have made sense at the time, I don't know, but uh, today it seems that it's really at odds with, with what we want to see. And I, I, I sort of want to hear like what changed, like what's different now, what changed over time. I think that there are people who would say, uh, who may be listening, who are not involved in the electricity sector, who would say, well, you know, this is a, these are regulated monopolies with public commissions that oversee them. So doesn't that solve the problem of getting them, you know, of, of having a, a functioning sector? So can you give us a little like big picture overview? Yeah, well, I'm so grateful that Marielle and Jean will be here to give specific examples of why that regulatory structure is not sufficient. Uh, in order to oversee these companies. But you know, when, when we set on this adventure of building an electric grid, the idea was essentially that in order to build the grid, you didn't wanna build two grids or three grids. It wasn't really a great idea to have a competitive enterprise in terms of stringing poles and wires to all our homes and businesses. And it was gonna be enormously expensive and that you needed a lot of capital uh, to come into the space in order to do that. And so uh, the, initial titans of the industry. Uh, Samuel Insull was the right-hand man to Thomas Edison, helped to essentially negotiate with state legislatures to say, hey, look, if you protect us from competition so that we have easier access to financing, we can then build out the grid less expensively and, and, and serve more people more effectively. So the trade-off will be these companies then get their guaranteed profit. They're overseen by the public, uh, these private companies. But in return, they're gonna offer something of high value to the public, which is access to reliable and affordable electricity. And for decades, as long as you are willing to accept the asterisk of sort of the environmental impact that we were ignoring uh, from that model, it worked terrifically. We built, uh, you know, we built out one, sort of the, one of the engineering marvels of the 20th century, which is to say we connected most folks to the grid. Uh, and, and thanks to the federal government in the 30s, we also connected uh, rural homes and businesses that were left out from that initial wave. Um, and, and we built ever larger centralized power plants that were uh, lowering the cost of electricity. So decade by decade, you actually were paying less for electricity than you were the decade before. Um, that all kind of came to a halt in the 1970s where essentially we ran into the wall of the economies of scale of power plant construction, that it became actually more expensive to build bigger. Um, and that the, the, there was a breakdown in the model where folks assumed who had been in the industry for decades, that energy use would just keep growing and they would always have a market to build more power plants. And so where we, what we've sort of been doing is in the last 50 years almost, we're sort of paddling upstream to get the things that we want, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy like solar energy or access to the markets for community solar or other ways of developing energy. All of this is going against the flow of, of the incentives for the utility companies. And you know, Seth and Rick mentioned this in the first panel, their incentives are to build more infrastructure to serve 
uh, the customer, electric customers. And the thing is that we don't need them to build it in the same way that they've been doing it. And the, but we haven't restructured the rules of the market in order to encourage them to do something different in part because they oppose us and when we try to do that. So we're in this situation right now where we've got a hundred years of flow in this river and every once in a while, we're trying to like paddle to the shore or paddle somewhere different, but there's just so much momentum behind it, whether it's the institutional inertia of the utilities themselves or the legal and political uh, power that they have over the decision-making process. And that's led to what we're, some of these hopeful moments though, in what we're seeing, uh, 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 whether it's in Maine or New Mexico and Arizona and other places uh, of ways that we can fight back against that flow. That's great, Gene. I was wondering if you could just like help us think about like, well, what does that actually mean on the, like talk a little bit about some of the examples and ways that you're seeing um, utility power play out. Like what, is, what are the problems? What are the things that they're blocking and doing at the ground level? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the premises of um, the current power system is what people would call a regulatory compact or compact. And what that is essentially is that we gave a ton of private um, companies a guaranteed monopoly over servicing territories. Um, and with that was, you know, as John was saying, democratizing the grid. Um, we didn't want to build, you know, two just overlapping grids. So with that, um, the compact was, hey, you've got a guaranteed set of customers, you've got a guaranteed revenue. Um, and in exchange for that, we are actually going to govern you and um, put, you know, utility commissions so to regulate you essentially. And what's happened um, is that we had now have a pretty broken system in terms of regulation. Um, and that have not been able to combat exactly what John uh, was talking about. We have a system where we have pretty significant regulatory capture, where regulators are either coming from the utilities or being guaranteed jobs after um, with the utility that they are regulating. And it really becomes a situation where we have the fox guarding the hen house in a lot of ways. And the uh, conclusion of all of that and the result is that we don't have a system that's fighting for our public interest anymore. We have a system that is actually benefiting private corporate interests or the utilities interests. And I'll, I'll talk about, you know, we see this in a, a bunch of different ways. Um, there are significant examples of energy violence that we see in our system. We have a system that is majority fossil fuel right now. And who suffers the most? The disproportionate amount of communities of color in this country who live disproportionately close within three miles of a fracked gas plant and a coal plant. Those are the people who are suffering from that dirty energy system. We also have energy violence in the form of unaffordability and energy poverty. We were able to track this year the millions of families who were disconnected during COVID for failure uh, to be able to pay. And at the same time, the increasing shareholder profits that all the top corporate utilities actually made this year. Um, they could have taken just a t a less than 1% of the executive compensation and shareholder returns that they got this year for COVID and put it towards saving the over 1 million households that they cut off, but they didn't. And regulators didn't force them to do that. And I think the last type of um, energy violence that we're seeing is of course the violence that comes from climate disasters. People are unable to actually keep on their connection during hurricanes, floods, wildfires, and heat domes right now. And distributed energy is a way that we can actually make uh, energy truly resilient. All of those pieces are coming together to solidify monopoly power in this country. And it's also stifling the absolute clean energy transition that we need and the rooftop and community solar that we need to combat those types of energy violence and actually work in the public interest. You, so you, we've got this situation of, you know, ownership models and market structures that don't work. Um, and we've got a captured regulatory, you know, oversight system, captured regulators. You were involved at, um, in a case in Arizona that, you know, looked to sort of do an end run around, as I understand it anyway, a relationship between the state's uh, public uh, utility commission 
and an investor-owned uh, uh, utility there. You, you you involved in this case that used antitrust policy um, to actually go after some of the predatory behavior by that utility that had been supported by that by the Public Utility Commission. Could you just give us? I know there are lots of ins and outs of the case, but can you give, give us an overview of like what the approach that you took and, and, and we're trying to do and where the case stands now? Yeah, so um, it's great that people are tuning into ILSR, uh, who's at the forefront of thinking about monopolies and how this works. Um, we are at the vanguard right now of applying antitrust law to the utility sector, which for so long has been immune from antitrust bombs. Um, and essentially, just to back up a second, Antitrust, the whole point of antitrust, the thrust of creating these laws was to actually protect our democracy. It was to ensure that corporations did not have greater voice over our democracy than everyday citizens. That is the background and that's why we need to break up large monopolies because we don't want our regulators and our politicians to be controlled. So what we're doing right now is seeing how that type of law, antitrust law, can challenge pretty um, egregious behavior from utilities where they are cutting out their competition. How can we do that? So the case in Arizona is super interesting. It is actually, uh, the Salt River Project is a public utility, but it's actually been found to operate like an IOU and a corporation. Um, but they essentially, uh, and this is very common. So a lot of people on this call will hear this pattern and it'll be ring very true. Um, SRP, Salt River Project, saw that there was a threat to their revenue from rooftop solar because suddenly people are generating our own power and we are biting into their revenue source. So what they did is that they jacked up the rates for solar rooftop solar customers by 65%. And what that did is it dropped the amount of applications for rooftop solar by 96%. So basically gutted rooftop solar uh, in, in Arizona in that territory. That is classic anti-competitive behavior under antitrust because you have a company launching an anti-competitive um, action and literally obliterating the competition. So we used antitrust law um, in this case. Uh, it is right now, um, very interesting background, but right now it is currently sitting before the Ninth Circuit and we are still waiting for a decision. But if the Ninth Circuit actually finds that yes, this was antitrust violation, then this can actually open a huge um, area of case law to use antitrust against utilities and how they are trying to cut out competition. That's terrific. That's really exciting to hear. Um, Marielle, I want to turn to you. You know, part of how we've gotten to where we are is we've had a ton of utility mergers over the years. And, you know, we now have these giant utilities that span multiple states, um, you know, in some cases, as, as we learned earlier, uh, owned by big global conglomerates, real lack of accountability to the places that they serve. Um, you, your organization uh, challenged uh, a utility merger uh, uh, late last year and won, which is pretty extraordinary. And um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about like what happened and what, you know, sort of the decision that came down. I'm really curious, particularly about like the basis of, of saying no to this merger. And also, as I understand it, it's the same uh, conglomerate that owns our electric utility in Maine. So it's a small world. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Um, Avangrid Ibadrola, yes, the same company that has high rates and um, the highest forced outage rates, that means brownouts and blackouts in the country, sought to merge with the public service company of New Mexico, that's PNM, in an $8 billion merger. But Avangrid and Ibadrola could not overcome their own track record of outages and unreliability diminished service quality, more than $63 million in penalties and violations in Maine, in New York, in Connecticut. Um, and they failed to abide by the commission, our commission's own rules and laws. They basically came in and said, we got so much money, kiss the ring right here, we're coming in. And we were like, uh, not so fast. Um, and you know, just one note to activists, to create networks um, and connect to people nationally and internationally because 
Representative Seth Barry was was critical. Like he he actually wrote um, an affidavit that we ended up using as part of our fight to uh, to actually bring in Ibadrola, the parent company. They wanted to just have Avangrid, but we argued, well, but Ibadrola is like literally pulling the strings. And so it was actually the affidavit, um, the declaration by um, Representative Barry that helped win the day uh, in court. The hearing examiner and the commission found that the risks and harms significantly weighed any benefits for ratepayers, um, which was an enormous, enormous victory. Um, the hearing examiner, some people call them the an administrative law judge, and the commission found that the merger was not in the public interest, which essentially, just so you know, is a very low bar. Um, but we worked and worked um, really hard to show uh, that this company in particular was unworthy of coming into New Mexico. And I'd like to just tell you one important story that really relates to what Jean had said before. Ibadrola and Avigrid testified testified that their goal was to use PM as their beachhead. It's a military term to land and from that landing attack can be launched. So under cross-examination, the Avangrid CEO admitted that their purpose was to consolidate renewable production for their own financial growth. So it's not you know, it was it was not only the extraction of our resources, but literally the export of that money out, not only not only to Wall Street, but to Spain. So this is exactly what Gene was talking about. They wanted to consolidate the market, get rid of any competition, right? And then jack up rates um, and then sell to wherever they wanted. Um, and and literally, they said that they chose PM to get a southwestern platform in the form of a government protected monopoly for which they could make further acquisitions and sell our renewable energy for their private profit. Of course, all of us are in favor of, of renewable energy, which will shortly dominate the grid if we're going to survive, but not for the exploitation of a foreign company with such a bad track record. I'll, I'll just say one last thing is that one of the things that the, uh, one of the things that they wanted to do is create these quote baby affiliates that then could buy up all the rest outside of, um, outside of P&M's beachhead. Um, and the commission found that they didn't have the resources to police not only Avangrid p and but all those other baby affiliates that they said that they were going to create for the umbrella company, Ibadrola. Well, congratulations on that. That's really terrific. Um, I'm curious a little bit about the politics sort of around that. I mean, I, you know, a lot of the utilities, and I think Avangrid did this, you know, in, the, in this context, they make promises about, you know, we're gonna build a big, you know, renewable, you know, so, you know, solar renewable uh, power uh, production, we're going to offer this jobs, you know, these sorts of claims. And, you know, in some cases, I don't know if this is true uh, in New Mexico, but in some cases, it seems like, you know, people get, you know, hooked on those ideas and, you know, are willing to sort of jettison concerns about ownership, about control, about oversight, sort of all of the democratic kinds of qualities that you're talking about and that emerged in the commission's decision. And I'm just curious how that played out with other organizations and groups in New Mexico. Well, they, Avangrid repeatedly said, we were the only one who opposed them. Well, we were, and there were a lot of, um, there were even press people, they were like, Marielle, you know, why are you fighting this? You're going to lose. M money talks. And I said, well, we have to, we have to speak the truth and talk about energy democracy, really. Um, and what we had to, what we also, what all, we also brought out a lot of, um, elicit a lot of evidence. So let, I'll just give you one example that, you know, made the papers. Three, count them three, p and executives stood to make $29 million from the merger. 
and you compare that to 480,000 residential New Mexican customers, um, so current PNM customers, and you know what they were going to get? Less than those three people, a dollar fifty-four a month. So it was that kind of information that we not only elicited, but then we, of course, one of the other one of the other things is to take it out of which. Gene is also extremely good and Center for Biological Diversity is, take it out of the, the little confines of the, of the legal case and to, um, and to inform um, and educate people. We were on the front page of the newspapers on a regular basis, sometimes as much as once a week, um, to talk about these kinds of inequities. And the, 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 the question really that we should be asking is, are we going to, we are going to transfer, if we're going to survive, we have to transform the grid and it's got to be 100% renewable. And we're on the cusp of not only transferring the electric grid for our electricity, but as, as, as Representative Barry said, to transform it to meet the transportation needs and the housing sector needs. So we have going to increase renewable usage by a lot. And the question is, are we going to replicate the exact same system of inequity and inequality and of racism, um, you know, and then literally export the profits to Wall Street at 1% or are we going to shift that model? Are we gonna have our power um, and stop the violence, um, stop the violence? Another point that I made in the hearing, also to Jean Su's point was, Literally the day, the, the, the Monday after the hearing was supposed to end, PNM was set to disconnect ratepayers, 21,000 ratepayers from electricity. Meanwhile, they're throwing out millions and, 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 and billions uh, um, to the executives and the shareholders. And one of the things what they said was, well, we'll 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 give you we'll we'll cut off uh we'll, we'll eliminate sorry we'll eliminate about half of the COVID um disconnect notices and I literally just asked why not all of them you're you're doing an eight billion dollar merger why not just eliminate the COVID disconnects and they were just like uh we can't do that you know and it's that kind of thing over and over and over again and that's the, that's the real day to day violence because when that orange notice comes into your mailbox and you are literally concerned about should I have food on my table or have electricity that's not what we want to do for a just society I just read that during COVID child poverty um, including food insecurity has gone up and meanwhile PM made 190 million dollars in profit just last year Wow. Wow. Um, John, I'm going to turn back to you just with a, a sort of short closing question, you know, as, as you know, you sort of reflect on um, these uh, really incredible fights and insights that um, that our panelists have brought today, you know, how do we, uh, you know, what, what are there transformative ways we can get out of having, you know, sort of constant kind of rear guard fights with utility companies over, you know, you know, in California, there's this big thing around, you know, they're, they're really trying to change the rules of net metering in order to, to stymie distributed solar. Um, you know, what are kind of, how do we think about this big picture and, and, and how do we sort of move in a way that, that um, you know, that, that, that is, is more transformative? And I, and I mean that not only in the context of how electricity is structured, but, you know, how do we think about, you know, some of the points that Marielle and, and, and Jean have raised around, you know, the, the, the ways in which monopoly utilities take advantage of racism and further racism in order to, um, uh, to, to, to augment their power. Yeah, I, I'm gonna take a stab at, at an answer to that question. I just wanna emphasize for folks, if you like what you've heard from Marielle or from Jean or from Seth and Rick, um, all three, uh, three out of the four have been guests on ILSR podcasts, our Building Local Power or Local Energy Rules podcast sometimes to talk about the very issues that they were here to join us to talk about today. So if you would like to hear them speak more and at greater length, uh, you can do that on our website. Um, 
we are a nonprofit, as are many other groups here. Uh, you can donate to help support this great work at ilsr.org slash donate, uh, New Energy Economy, the Center for Biological Diversity, or Our Power Maine. Uh, please check out the work that they're doing if you support and like what they're doing. Uh, you can do that financially as well as by joining this podcast and learning more about it. Um, I to, to try to tackle that very large question, Stacy, in terms of wrapping up, I think I would just say that this, <laughs> to go back to my river metaphor, like we have to sort of change the way that the entire system is flowing. We have to, the problem that we have right now, especially with investor-owned utilities, but not solely with them, as we mentioned before, that we can have even examples of public power that are running in a problematic way is really, how do we break down the institutional power that these organizations have and, and disperse it? And Gene, I think, did such a great job of highlighting the importance of antitrust in, in all of this, that the, the purpose of that law was to protect our democracy from concentrations of power. And that can be private power, as we have with investor and utilities. It can also be public power. And one way we can do that is to not let one entity own everything. Um, you know, to at some places they've restructured and already broken apart, like who owns power plants and who owns the distribution system. Um, in some places, like New York, they're talking about restructuring how companies earn money. So we, you know, Rick, I think mentioned that we have these really high rates of return that are almost guaranteed for monopoly utilities, and we pay them for things we don't want them to do anymore, like build giant power plants. We need to change that. Hawaii has moved to a system uh, of almost entirely performance-based regulation. And it's very new and we don't know if it's gonna work very well, but there's a lot of hope behind that. And at least we're doing the right thing. Um, and then there's what our power is trying to do, which is honestly, I think one of the best things, which is to say, let's break up this utility. Let's, let's create a consumer owned core of it. And let's also do that with the idea that we're gonna allow lots of other entities, not just this utility to make the decisions about how the system runs. So like lots of folks building rooftop solar or energy storage or homes and businesses, uh, community solar, all of the kinds of things that allow people to make decisions independent of the utility that shrinks not only like the market share of that utility within the electricity sector, but then all of the political power that comes with that of having the monopoly of the relationships with regulators of, you know, the virtually unlimited amount of money they can have for the legal fights against you know, to promote their own mergers, to reward their executives, you know, all of these things come back to this idea that we've concentrated the power in this market within these particular companies. And we just, we need to attack it directly. And whether that's even just rhetorically, like noting that in these fights in California and saying, look, the utility wants to quash rooftop solar because it's a threat to their market share, to how they make money building transmission lines and building substations and transformers. Those are the things they want to do that they profit from. So of course they're opposed to this. Or by bringing, at, bringing to the table real substantive reforms, like in Hawaii, like in this, uh, it's called a high DER proceeding in California. I don't want to get into the weeds, but talking about how do we restructure the system to reduce the power of those institutions. That's great. And let's, uh, let's bring uh, back uh, Seth and Rick. Um, and for sort of our final um, wrap up here, we've got it, we've got just a few minutes left. But I think I want to ask everyone, um, you know, sort of what, what really motivates you? Like, what's, what's sort of one thing that really drives you in this work? Um, what's sort of the vision and thing that, that really um, is why you do this? And also, if you could, as a sort of part two of the question, if you could say just something about how people who are in this, who are in the audience, who are listening today, um, you know, what's a something that they can do to get involved or an initial step um, that you, that you can offer them. Um, so, uh, uh, Rick, let's start with you. Well, thank you again, Stacy. It's great to be with you. I, you know, I, I think I may have hinted at this in the answer to the very first question, but what motivates me is the need for people to be in control in a increasingly volatile world. We need to create structures where people are actually in control and we can no longer rely on the institutions that uh, historically we've turned to, to run things for us. And, and the good news is we don't need to. We, we have the tools through uh, all of the, the craziness of today's world involving social media and means of connecting with one another at an individual level, uh, people of shared interests, to work across the usual power structures, across the silos, and share information, share passions and enthusiasms, and get this done. I, I, I think we have an opportunity 
to build a more democratic small d future where self-determination is respected, where uh, people are really in charge. Um, but you know, we've also seen the downsides to some of these technologies that are allowing that. So we all have to be vigilant, but that's really what motivates me. And I would say to your second question, we people just throw yourselves in, uh, find something worthy uh, and, and just get involved with it. I have to tell you, I've learned a lot from Seth Barry. I've learned a lot from a lot of other people uh, because I'm newly back to the legislature. The world has changed a lot in the 20 years since I, I was gone. And, um, and but information is very accessible and it's so easy. In Maine, you know, you raise your hand at the wrong moment, you're elected to the school board. So I, I just think that it's a great chance for people just to throw yourselves in. And we certainly would love you to throw yourselves in even remotely to the Our Power effort, ourpowermain.org is where you can connect. Thanks. That's great, Seth. Yeah, um, I, I, I feel so many um, echoes in my head of, of what Rick just said. I mean, the, um, the, the partnership that this has engendered has been incredibly inspiring. Working with Rick, working with Muriel, um, you know, with John and Stacy, um, ILSR has been an incredible partner, and 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 this is this this is building. You know, it's it's become a movement here in Maine, but I really feel that there's a movement in Sipian in the U.S. as well, and the industry um, has its eye on us. They're probably on the line here today. That you know, and and they want to crush it, but I think I think we can crush it. I think we can do this. You know, I, I think we we have something that is really, that, that the American people are ready for, and that many communities um, are, are uh, eager to take on. There are so many ways into this idea. What I, what I love about working in this space is that our power is, is about equity, right? And a, and a just transition. Um, it, it, it is about anti-monopoly, yes, and self-reliance. It is about climate for sure. Um, that's my number one uh, motivation and sort of entry point for myself. And it's about democracy and 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 democrat a more democratic economy. So every problem that I go to bed at night worrying about, every problem that you know, when I think about my children, my my two sons, and 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 you know, I used to be a teacher, my former students and their children, the next generation, I, there's so much to worry about for them. And when I go to bed at night and worry about, about them and their future and what that planet's gonna look like and, and what their democracy is gonna look like, I find an answer in this effort and, and, in, and in this partnership with all of you. So I hope people will go to ourpowermain.org. That's you know, my ask and, and stay on for the after party because you know, we, we look forward to trying to answer all of the incredible questions. Um, so many good, uh, good comments going into the chat and the Q and A. So uh, please stay on with us if you can. Great, Jean. Um, there's a lot of promise to this after party, so everybody really should stay on. <laughs> a lot of hype here. Um, yeah, I, you know, I began my career through climate, working in different parts of Africa and Asia, and I know we have global folks on the line today, which is amazing. Um, so I take this from a climate standpoint. We really, literally, only have the next eight years to significantly, radically change our energy system. And when I came to the States and started working here, I think there is such heartbreak in how racist and violent this energy system is. Um, it is a form of all the societal issues that we face here. So climate justice, the fight for climate justice is the fight for racial justice, for societal justice, for gender justice. And um, that's what keeps me mo motivated to do this work. And we have to keep going because we have no choice. Um, and I think for those who want to get involved, you can actually start right now to figure out your energy system and how to change it. Um, this isn't about decarbonization. This is about the whole picture. So get on in and do it, what, whatever angle it is, um, and run, right? You have Representative Barry here and, and Senator Bennett, run, run and make a change so that you can be the decision maker instead of all of us trying to get decision makers to do the right thing. I love that, Marielle. Um, so dare to struggle, dare to win. Um, courage is contagious, you know? Once you start fighting, then then people want to be and join. And, you know, I was texting 
um, uh, Representative Barry, and I would tell him when we got something good that happened, he's like, you go, you know, I mean, I have to just tell you that's love, you know, and I've never met um, Representative Barry, but what does Cornell West say that justice, uh, justice is love made public. That's what we're after, you know, and uh, I just want to say that I got into this because I was thinking I used to do police misconduct work, not a light subject. Right. Um, but I, I found out I knew about cl climate, but I didn't understand the urgency. This is now 12, 12, 15 years ago. And I thought, how can I look at my kids in their eyes and say I didn't do what I knew how to do. And so what I'm asking you all out there who are listening is. I don't know what your talent is. What are you What are you passionate about, and what can you bring? Are you a, a pianist? Are you a painter? Are you a great computer graphic artist? What do you? Are you a writer? What do you know how to do? We need you. We need you. This fight is big enough to to include your talents. It's about getting involved, and it's about making your family bigger than your just your nuclear family. It's about making your family, our movement family to create justice in the world. Thank you so much. I am so energized after hearing all of you and the incredible work. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable what's going on. I wanna thank you, all of our panelists for participating. I wanna thank everyone who turned out in the audience. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to stay connected to ILSR, I encourage you to sign up for one of our newsletters. I'll drop that in the chat. Um, as John mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization. So all of this work is made possible through donations. And so, um, and you can follow us on social media, but please do engage if you'd like to be involved both uh, in our energy work and in the anti-monopoly work we do across different sectors of the economy and in building local power at the community level. Um, and please do stay on for the after party. We had just, we barely 